And once again, thank you for joining us for Illinois Owls. And Peggy, I will turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you. And thank you for everybody that keeps coming on. There's numbers just a ticking. Um, so on the sustainability thing, I have to add, um, we are, you know, I'm working from home today. I can go up to my nature center. We aren't printing tons and tons of paper because you get this recording and you can hear it again. It's just very exciting to see just when you think you're doing things really well that you can do them even that much better environmentally. So um, it's, it's been a little bit of a stress and strain over the last year in learning, but I don't see us ever not doing some of these. If I were to hold this program at my um, one of my offices, you know, maybe 10, 20 people would get the opportunity to get there. And this way, we're also um, serving a much larger crowd and reaching a lot more people that may or may not be able to make it to an office. So it's exciting. And I have to admit, I get a little excited. I see a lot of people on here that know uh, that I know that know me um, for better for worse and it is a topic that I absolutely love and that became apparent as I tried to pare it down. I did get your questions ahead of time but just so you know there was like 70 something questions and I tried to go back through and make sure most of them were were, were in there. There's a few maybe I missed. Um, so hopefully if you kind of listen for your for your uh, question that you've already asked there are going to be a lot of people on today. So clearly we may not get to everyone's question, but hopefully you'll have um, a viewpoint when we're done and be able to see that uh, some of those things get answered in a different, different way. I'm going to, because I talk with my hands, I'm now gonna take off my video. I like to leave it on for a little bit so that you get to know your speaker a little better. Shut that down so we can get out of the way of my, my notes. And I have to tell you, I was playing around with this and, um, see if I can get my, there it is. So I've made this screen. So if you're having trouble finding your mute, my mom is wonderful at unmuting and muting on hers, but she never can find the video. It's right next to it. Um, so keep those, if you will, we have a lot of people. It's easier for bandwidth and such um, to keep things flowing. If you have questions, that chat button is that little voice bubble down there. And then I just wanted to introduce you to Forrest Stump that is a carved bear at the nature center where I work. And he's uh, looks in my window year round, kind of creepy but just a little bit of helpful. So let's get going. I'm so excited about this topic <clears throat> and I have been for hey, some time. Hey Peggy. Yes. Um, we have a few requests. If you're able to um, get a little closer to your microphone or speak just a little bit louder, we're having some people that are having a challenging time hearing you talk. One, and I did check in my volume. I will try to talk louder and then double check your volume on your computer too, if you would, and make sure your volume is up as well. And that might help. So I hope I can talk loud enough, long enough for you all to hear me. Thanks for making a note and letting Aaron know and Aaron, thanks for catching it. So I am not, you know, I'm a little clever, a little punny, but who do we know? And a lot of people asked what owls we have and that's gonna be the focus on the, on the presentation because we don't have that many. And those who know me know I love to study groups of animals where I can get really good at a complete group. Woodpeckers was one of the in everyday environments that I did. And you can know all seven in the hour. And so we're gonna look at these and you're gonna know them all very quickly. And I put them here on this chart. So they are birds of prey, they are raptors, they are meat eaters. Uh, some of them are a little more uh, insectivory. They'll eat in large insects and such, but I highlighted in kind of a brown color, the fab four. And I'll explain that in a moment. These sizes, you guys, I looked at so many resources, I can't even cite them. So I took the average width and length. So you're talking, it's actually length and width, length and width. So the, the right number is the wingspan and the body length is the first number. I tried to get the best average I could, but the goal for you today isn't to worry so much about exact size, but look how they descend. We go from great horned owls clear down to the Northern Sawwit in size. And I just wanted to make sure you could see that. We have two families. It's the order Strigiformes. There's only two families of, owl, of owls. And one is the Titanidae. And that's my favorite, I got to tell you. It's the barn owl. And we'll see that one. And it's got this beautiful heart-shaped owl uh, a face and sometimes called the monkey-faced owl or the heart-shaped heart-faced owl. And the other family has all the other true owls. And that um, so that is the, it's the Strigiform, Strigiformidae. Um, it's the only other family. There's only two families of owls. So the Fab Four, the ones that we have in Illinois full-time all year 
top to bottom are the great horned owl, the bard, the barn, and the screech. There's four of the eight. The other ones come in our area mostly in the winter and mostly northern Illinois. So for those of you way south, you may only have the Fab Four, but those of us up here in Northern Illinois may get a good eye on some of these other, other ones in the winter. And then someone was asking about um, Iowa, uh, the Eastern side of Iowa, Western Illinois, you would have the, the Fab Four year round. And then you also over in that part of Iowa would, would potentially see in your, you know, in the right habitats, these other four uh, winter guests. So what do we know? Let me say, and this is the general owl information. Males and females almost always have similar plumage except the snowy. The snowy is, uh, females very barred. I've got some pictures from a friend of that. Females in all birds of prey tend to be a third larger. Uh, research tends to believe that might be because they're the ones sitting on the nest full almost full time with uh, maybe just a few breaks if they have um, a, a partner who wants to sit there for a minute while they get a stretch break, which does happen in like great horned owls. So birds of prey, one third larger. That's hard to tell unless you see an extremely tiny um, great horned owl, and that's probably a male. If you're not sure, it's hard to tell unless they're nearby each other, and the larger will be the female. They're at the top of their food chain. They are predators. Being at the top of your food chain also means that your species doesn't have the high number that the lower food chain would have, say, rabbits, voles, and shrews. So you're more sensitive to change, right? And they are extremely territorial. They will kill other owls. Barred owls will hunt screech owls. And in a territory war, great horned owls have been known to fly past a sitting barred owl and literally just take their head off. So they are extremely protective of their space once they are on nest um, and not so much maybe midsummer, right? When they're out trying to forage and feed young. They're nocturnal by nature, but it's not impossible to see them during the day. Our barred owls love to hunt during the day. They'll even wade into water. They're, they're a little special bird. Um, and we'll talk more about those guys later. Uh, they do an extremely important ecological service. They are hunting all the things that make us crazy because those things at the bottom of the food chain are in high number. Um, if you have rabbits, you might love them, but other people, they're eating prime garden plants. Uh, rodents, voles, especially with a winter where you have a lot of snow cover and they've been, those smaller rodents have been protected and they've multiplied a lot. So the birds of prey are your best ecological service. I'm where I'm sitting right now in Northern Illinois, I'm in Sycamore, straight out my window, one block, I have a pair of nesting great horned owls. I check on them pretty much daily as I take a walk. And to my left shoulder, a little bit south and east, I have a pair of nesting um, red-tailed hawks. I'm pretty sure my rodent population is decreasing quite quickly. So each species also has a number of calls. You may read that they have songs. I've yet to figure out what that would be. I don't believe that. Like woodpeckers, woodpeckers don't have songs, they have calls. So our owls have multiple calls. And I don't know what the barred owl is doing, but that, the barred owls have a range of crazy sounds that may have led to some of the myths before owls were really understood. People believed they belonged to witches, they were from the afterlife and all these things. I'm thinking the barred owl had a hand in that because there's some, there's some screeching, snoring, horrible sounds that come out of that bird for as small as it is. So also people on the call that know me know I love to think about the toolbox first. What makes an animal that animal? What makes that animal capable of surviving or what plays a role in its opportunities to do what it needs to do. Now we, we know that owls are great hunters, but the reason they are, they have some, some clear identifiables. They have safety glasses. They have what's called a nictate, nictating membrane, a third eyelid, that when they capture food that's kicking, especially our larger owls that are picking up rabbits or uh, rats or um, skunks, things that are gonna fight back, that nictating membrane creates an opaque gog like cover over their eye and allows them a little bit of protection in case they would take a kick to the eye. Vice grips, their feet, okay? Their feet do all the holding and they can actually turn one of their toes around to get a better grip. So they technically have a perching foot uh, with one toe in the back, but they have a swivel toe that allows them to swing around and get two in the front and two in the back to hold tight. 
They have chaps, some of them, feathered legs. You're snowy, you're great horned. Um, they, they especially have thick feathered legs. So when those things, again, are kicking, biting, they can be protected. They'll get a mouthful of feather, but they won't necessarily get a leg. Under their feathers, around their ears, are fine feathers that give them kind of like the, the microphone muffs that our um, news reporters use to, to buffer wind, helps to buffer the wind. Their cloak of invisibility, it, their whole feather system has this velvety appeal. If you pick up a feather when you're out hiking and you look at it and you're like, I wonder if it's a hawk or an owl. Those are kind of the two that overlap in colors. If you look and feel it, it's like silky soft if it's an owl. And that is all over the feathers. So when that big chunky shaped body goes through the air at night, it muffles all the sound of the wind so that the animals it's hunting doesn't hear it coming, as well as the front edge of their wing has a serrated edge to break that wind sound. Uh, hawks don't have that. Hawks don't need it. They're a lot faster than owls and can dive in and catch something without worrying about sneaking up. They have night vision goggles, right? They can see at night. They have mostly rod. Their eyes are so big, they don't move in their head. They're really muscular, full of rods. Rods in our eyes collect light. Cones are for color. They have mostly rods. They can take a tiny bit of moonlight or starlight, refracted light off the snow and see really well. Um, they have end cutting pliers. And I have a picture of those, I think, coming up that their beak has to be able to tear. It can't make a hole in a tree. It has to use holes that are created by fallen limbs or smaller owls will use holes made by woodpeckers years past but they have they can tear and that means they can bite so people who have to work with birds of prey that's why they wear those big leather gloves between the talons and the beak it's a very dangerous uh, position to be in let alone if they flog you with that bony wing and, and crack you in the head they have uh, built-in hearing aids they can hear forever and their satellite dish face directs the sound right into those holes. There is some new research saying that they don't believe all owl ears are asymmetrical, but it was believed until recently that they all had asymmetrical ear openings, allowing them one would be higher and one would be lower. And they can then turn that satellite dish face, capture sound and triangulate because of that asymmetric listening ability. And then that way their, uh, their percentage of correct hit is much higher. And I put in swivel because the vertebrae in an owl's neck allow it to turn its head over 270 degrees. I'm sure that was part of the concern that they were owned by witches was because the first, you know, people to see owls spinning their heads around probably got a little concerned. And it's really an illusion because they get as far as they can and they spin back so fast, it looks like they spun, have spun their head around. But we all know physically they can't do that. It would be... Uh, strangulation for sure. Um, they do lack a garbage disposal. They don't have that in their toolbox. What do I mean? Pellets. They have to create basically a big fur ball full of bones that they cannot digest and literally have to, yep, hack it up uh, be often before they eat again to get rid of that out of the gizzard, which is the upper muscular part of the stomach. So small pieces make it through, big pieces, not so much. And I know that's a lot of information, but this is really important that you see if they lose one of these tools, just one, one talent, it could reduce their survival by a large percentage. So let's move on and look at our birds while we think about those things and maybe we'll see some of those uh, tools in the toolbox. All right, so <laughs> head start to feeding these largest owl babies, they're out now. Um, and you can see they are considered a species in decline. And you're gonna find out later, it's really based on habitat loss. And we'll talk about that a lot more later. Um, cons they're considered common. So when we talk about decline, it's usually in specific areas. They, er they nest early. They start calling and courting each other in November. You'll hear the, the, the louder um, male, the higher pitched female, and they love to do duet calls for months, for months and months. And then by the time they court, in um, January, maybe in December, January, they're on nest in February, they go silent. If you hear great horned owls calling after February, uh, usually those are owls that have not uh, mated and found a, a significant other. Um, and they're just able to draw attention to themselves and not um, take into concern that they might um, draw attention to the babies or eggs or the, or the female on the nest. 
usually there's two or three owlets. That's pretty common throughout. There's some smaller birds that lay that may lay more eggs, more you know, smaller owls, depending on the availability of habitat. And they prefer wooded areas. But these guys like urban settings as long as there's mature trees. There's many, uh, there are many people online showing uh, birds that are in just large adult broken trees in urban settings in town. Something special about the toolbox for the great horned owl, look at that last bullet point. 500 pounds of pressure per square inch in their grip. When I started my apprenticeship down in the land between the lakes in Kentucky at a nature center, I got to work with a great horned owl. And the person before me that did their apprenticeship had been holding the great horned owl and something startled it. It was a blind bird and something startled it and it, it flinched and grabbed the glove tighter. And all of a sudden the, the person felt that they were in pain. They went to the hospital. It didn't break the bone in his hand. It popped a hole like a paper punch in a tiny bone. The tip of the talon literally just popped a hole and there's nothing you can do for that, but let it calcify in. But it's a, a good example of just how strong these guys are. Um, they do eat larger prey and they are, if you have a skunk in your yard, start hoping that you get a great horned owl which also leads us to understand that, you know, owls don't have a very developed olfactory lobe. So they don't have the great sense of smell that we do or most, most humans do or that dogs do. So great horned owls love skunk, doesn't bother. A lot of times if people bring a rehabilitator, an owl in a box and say, it's a big owl, I don't know what it is. You'll see them smell the box because they eat, they eat skunk often enough. They usually smell like skunk. Um, the male will feed the female when she's on nest and keep her, um, and he'll actually, like I said, take a few turns sitting on the eggs to give her a time out. So that's exciting. Um, they only weigh like, I think it was two and a half to three and a quarter pounds. They look huge. Now I will say from my experience holding owls and birds of prey on my arm, you don't think that weighs much until you have to hold your arm out that long. You have to hold your arm out because if you're working with birds of prey and you put your arm down, they want to be at the highest point, which is beyond your leather glove and usually on your shoulder. So here's a few pictures. These are pictures from uh, friends of mine, uh, Ken Reinhardt and um, a friend of mine's husband. They have shared pictures today. You'll see their names coming up on slides. They wanted to point out that far right slide. It looks a little blurry because I wanted to bring it in. What's happening in that owl's eye is that nictating membrane is coming across and it's a little opaque. And that's for whatever reason, it was just the one eye. He must have had a, a, needed to dampen his eye or something, but that is what happens. They literally go, the eyes go kind of blurry looking. Probably didn't help them when people were concerned about their well being. This is a very serious bird. It's a bird you don't necessarily want to mess with, right? And they will cl click their beaks. When the owls are upset, they, they make this like, like a snap sound. I went out one time because somebody told me at a marsh nearby, there were these owlets. There were three, which is a lot, in a broken cottonwood tree. So I went out with my camera and I found them and they were peeking out and I was sitting there trying to quietly take pictures. And I heard that beak sound behind me. And I slowly turned and looked up and the great horned female was, had her head tilted and eyeing me and was snapping her beak. So I just left. I wasn't going to take any chances that she might do a flyby with those talons. Kind of made the hair on my neck stand up. But these are such a beautiful bird. Um, again, the tufts on the head are not ears and they're not horns. That's just the name given because it kind of looks that way. Uh, but those can be laid flat as well. These are actually pictures from last year, right after we went into kind of our uh, solitude, uh, catty corner across the street in the lot where I now have the red-tailed hawks, we had two owlets born. These are actually photos off of my camera. I apologize, my, I don't have really high quality cameras. Somebody was asking about best cameras. With owls, in order not to disturb them, you really need to get a, a good camera that has a really good lens so that you don't bother them. Any bird of prey, you need to keep as much distance between them as you can. These were taken from my front yard, right outside my front window. And I had an incredibly wonderful time watching these owlets um, come to life, if you will. And the thing right now that's really urgent, owls do not have the ability to fly when they end up on the ground. We don't have to save them. You can keep an eye on them. If they look injured, you know, and I'll uh, 
talk here in a little bit about calling the um, uh, the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. They have a rehabilitator list. But these owls literally are going to, the ones down here by me are going to start branching, which is a fancy word for big birds that fledge um, before they start hopping around on the ground. But when they hit the ground, when they go to the ground, they climb trees with their talons and their beak. And it looks horrible, but it's necessary. They have to build those muscles in their shoulders and backs and legs before they can take off and truly fly. Are they vulnerable? Absolutely. Dangerously vulnerable. But mom's around and mom's pretty scary. So if they think there's a dog, cat, or any other animal nearby, they will actually, you know, go down and go after them. But they have to go through this. It's just very hard to watch. So heads up, if you know where there's a nest, you may see owlets on the ground, you know, in this shape right there in these pictures, fuzzy, not able to do a lot. That's part of the process for them. And we have to give them that time to do that. Moving on to the barred owl, uh, Bubo varia. They don't breed till they're two. They're now starting to get organized to breed. The great horned owls are huge birds. And I'm gonna guess part of the reason they start so early is they have to feed larger young. So they wanna get a start on the food that's available. The barred owls are a little smaller. They're coming in now um, and, the, and the barn starting to you know have young. And right now there are two eggs in a box. I'm gonna show you in this presentation on, on the, in the forest preserve where I work. So the bards are still on eggs while the owlets are pretty big already and kind of like tall, fluffy penguin looking things. So about the same, you can kind of read this, these parts that, you know, we're looking at once they're hatched, you're still looking at well over a month to get them out there and moving around. Again, habitat, they want wooded habitat. The interesting thing about barred owls, they prefer to be near some form of water, river, lake, pond, because they do like crayfish. And they've been seen wading into water to grab little fish and crayfish. So you may want to consider barred owl attraction if you have property that has uh, some form of a water situation on it. Um, we still need to protect any animal at the top of the food chain, even though it says, you know, that they're not considered threatened at this time. It wouldn't take much, you know, to take them into a concerned level because there's just not that many animals when you get that high on the food chain. So um, any loss would be threaten, threatening to their situation. If there's a major habitat loss, they could be missing from an area where they've been commonly found very quickly. So we, even though they're not considered um, in decline yet, we still wanna always make sure we're protecting them. Now you guys um, may find these just beautiful. I do too. However, the only time I've been injured by a, an owl, it was a barred owl. So you can imagine when I see this face, you see beautiful, I see mean. <laughs> and uh, I, when I was working in Kentucky, the barred owl I had to work with did not like me. It only liked the full-time naturalist. And she was just swoon over him, but she would do everything in her power to make my life difficult and get my, to get my job done. And I had a group of uh, a whole busload of Elda Hostel, a group of seniors traveling through Kentucky down at Land Between the Lakes coming. And I had put a stick on the ground where our particular owl would fly off the perch. And as far as she could go, I put the stick so I knew to stand out of range. And I was talking and doing my presentation and we'd gone to the barred owl and she gave this low little hoot. And she flew off the perch toward me, but I didn't even flinch because I knew where that I was standing outside of that range. And I kept talking and you know what she did. She threw herself to her chest, stretched, turned her head and pierced my ankle through my sock with her beak. And my eyes got big, but I'm like young, right out of college, trying to be professional. So I just kept talking. She then flew back to the perch, turned her back to me and went to the bathroom. And I said, well, you know, the reason I don't hold her is she doesn't care for me and we don't want to stress the bird. And about that time, this lovely, lovely woman said, excuse me, dear, your presentation is very informative, but you're bleeding really badly and you might want to go take care of that. My entire sock, because this was the 80s, so I had a white sock on, was totally saturated. She had, she had pierced the ankle and I was bleeding. I said, pardon me for one moment, I'll be back. <laughs> I, said, I had to excuse myself to go fix an injury. So yeah, when I see these, I just think, yes, they're beautiful. But um, the other thing that I did not incorporate in this because it's very difficult with um, copyright and such are calls. I know people love to hear them. There is a wonderful site. If you go to um, Cornell's website, it's the 
lab of ornith Cornell's lab of ornithology, ornithology being the study of birds, or just type in allaboutbirds.org and you could probably search it there. You can come up with bird calls, really good ones. And that way I don't get in trouble for snitching bird calls offline that aren't mine to snitch. But that has made me realize I need a recording situation so I don't have to worry about copyright. When I went out on my same apprenticeship um, to call barred owls, and as many of you know, people believe they say, who cooks for you, who cooks for you all. And when you're in Kentucky, it's a very strong belief that that's where they learn to do that. And I was on a owling program with my boss. We each drove a 12 passenger white van. We went out to call owls and to let people hear them. So 24 people off the vans were standing in the pitch black and he says, go ahead and try. So I tried, I am not doing it for you today. I refuse to, you'd be so, I would get nothing but hate mail. And I tried to give my best who cooks for you, who cooks for you all over and over. And what happened was as I was doing that, because it didn't sound a thing like a barred owl, a small family of coyotes had approached in the darkness out of sheer curiosity. I love coyotes. They have a, they're more curious than cats. And they waited till just the right time and as close as they could get to all howl at the same exact time. I just stood there, 24 people went shooting into vans like little uh, 13 line ground squirrels all trying to get into a hole at the same time. And I stood there and my boss put his hand on my shoulder and said, it's okay, you'll get better. And I said, I'm never calling him again, not doing it. So be careful what you do. And also we have to remember if you start going out with, with recordings of calls to attract an owl, that you may be disrupting a situation where there's a uh, courtship going on. You may be throwing off adults that are trying to nest and concern that there's territorial concerns. So be thoughtful in your time of year and figure out the, if you, if you choose to call them in, be thoughtful as to what might be going on in their, in their current, you know, situation that might stress them out. Here's that picture of our nesting box. We did a 4-H had a, a, uh, an activity last year where the 4-H kids could hang up two different boxes to see which ones barred owls preferred. And they actually have chosen the one with a lid, not without, you know, and I, I guess I could have guessed that if there was a choice, they'd want a roof with, you know, with all the weather we have. And the picture on the right, I snapped last night off of the nestwatch.org live cam. So if you see right above that picture of the two eggs, the barred owl was peeking out. She was checking to see somebody was calling and she was calling back. So the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, if you just put in nestwatch.org today, you can go and the camera's on her. The hard part's when she doesn't move and lays there all the time. But last uh, yesterday when I checked, she, she was getting up. So I took that picture for you and put it in the presentation today. They're very small, just look like small, a little more rounded, but about the size of a chicken egg. Um, and you can watch these till they hatch and beyond. So I highly recommend it. I don't know if anybody notices, but down in the bottom of the box, there's a woodpecker feather. Hmm, that should tell us something. And uh, it's kind of exciting. If that's what inside our box looks like, okay? So nestwatch.org uh, for different cams. And this was one of them. Also, if I, I should go back, if you want to, we were talking about building um, nest boxes. People were asking, nestwatch.org has nest boxes for a bunch of birds and it has each one of the fab four there for you to design a box um, according to their plan. And it also adds, uh, someone had asked on the questions how high it has those two. And I think I have that coming up, kind of a, um, a picture at the end of the presentation of what it, that looks like on their site. Barn owls, as you know, my favorite everywhere but Antarctica, they are endangered because of habitat loss. They prefer a structure. They prefer to be up in something, closed box, cavity, anything, overlooking a meadow or continuous fields of say alfalfa, beans, anything that gives them that feeling of a large meadow. And they actually have three to seven eggs. And that's dependent on the food supply. If they have plenty of food as they're um, going into courtship and mating, they will lay more eggs because the you know ability to keep those babies alive will be better. And there's also a, um, there is a spot, if you go to the Illinois Department of Natural Resources, put in barn owl, um, you can find, they actually have a brochure um, on that where they can, um, you can get all the information on barn owls. And then if you have the appropriate site, 
um, you could then, they give you a barn owl design, they give you more information on it and who to contact. But if you just go to um, the, the IDNR site, you'll find it. If you punch in barn owl um, and barn owl box, you'll, be, you'll get it that way. I didn't have barn owl pictures from friends. I apologize, these are very old. This is my absolute favorite bird. This is the bird I worked with. That is the 80s version of the person you're listening to. No comments, you know, big hair was the thing, right? Pilot glasses. But look at the gorgeous feathering on this animal. This bird is so feather light and so tiny. And he and I had this great relationship and just every day he was excited to see me and they do this bobbing thing and he can turn his head all the way upside down and look at you. And it's the darn cutest thing in the world. And this is where it started. This is like 1988. And I fell in love with owls that long ago um, because I hadn't, you know, in college, you don't get to work with animals. You only get to talk about them. And every day when I would open up the back door of the nature center, if someone else had already gotten them out for the day, uh, this was my apprenticeship. I'd look out and, hey, buddy, and he would make the sound of air coming out of a tire. That's their social thing. It's like, Psh, Psh, just beautiful. And people would tell me that when they're very scared or upset, they have a scream that sounds like a, uh, it's a high-pitched woman-like scream being harmed. And I'm like, boy, I don't know. And sure enough, one day I was putting him back in his mew. A mew is where we keep the uh, raptors at night to keep them safe in their own little apartment. And I was right by the mew and the coyote I worked with, um, his area, his area was right next to the mew and he had been laying there and I didn't see him and he jumped up and the barn owl was sitting on my shoulder at that time and turned directly into my right ear and did that scream. And I literally dropped to my knees and I had cotton in my ear for days. It hurt so bad after he did that. And my hearing was off for like that whole, almost that whole next week. Yes, they can scream. Again, probably part of the reason people were terrified of them before they understood them. Because if you're walking through the woods at night and you hear that scream, I wouldn't stick around, right? We wouldn't want to hear, we wouldn't want to find out what that was about. So the next of our four, our last one, is the Eastern Screech Owl. They are in decline. They need, they need cavity nesting opportunities. They love old woodpecker holes. They love old dead trees. And what do we do? We clean them up and cut them down. If you can keep a snag on any property you own that's not gonna fall and damage your property or a person, we highly recommend it for so many wild animals. And this is part of the problem. They love the forest, they love woodlots. They're very urban friendly, but they need those trees and want a space to nest. They're very, they very much love cavities to nest in versus on top of anything. Uh, they eat mice and songbirds, um, as well as large insects. In the winter, it's almost all mice and songbirds that these little guys take. They do come in a couple colors. They come in gray and gray and uh, what are they? They said red. We used to in the 80s believe that there were three morphs. We call them morphs, red, brown, and gray. But now they've clearly, when I did some checking uh, for this program, they've reduced it to the two. So I guess they have red and red brown maybe. There's a little screech. Not a lot of pictures for screech owls. They do always look kind of like that when you first see them. And it's kind of a grouchy, don't wake me up look. Um, very small. The thing that I, I can't find research on it, uh, but when I was in Kentucky, I was continually finding them in the center of the road. If there was a stripe in the road, a reflective stripe, they were literally sitting along the road, same line as the stripe with their head down. And I would get out and they're tiny, um, grab them and they were fine. They weren't hit by a car or anything and just would just take them to the edge of the road and toss them and they'd fly off. I'm not sure what mesmerized them. Uh, if anyone's done some research on that, I haven't found it yet. But that whole center of the road thing's not healthy. That's not gonna help them. The next picture, because a lot of you asked about boxes, just because you build a nest box doesn't mean it's gonna happen. Cornell had one that they had put up for, for a specific species and it was like eight, seven years later, eight years, I don't know, before it even got used. If there's plenty of habitat, they may choose the habitat first. If they aren't happy or you don't look on that nest, nestwatch.org, some birds want stuff in the bottom like wood chips. Some birds want nothing in there. Uh, there are some requirements needed and that would replicate, uh, say a tree that had 
uh, a rotten hole in it with lots of debris in it, right? So that would be a bird would choose that one that looked like something in a nest box. So I put up a screech owl box. I did not mean to attract a screech owl, never had the hopes to attract a screech owl. Put up the screech owl box because I have a neighbor who doesn't like squirrels. Many of you probably don't either. I don't mind anything. I want my property to be as diverse as possible. And I really like the fox squirrels. So to protect them um, from him, he's a wonderful man. He's a farm, a farm guy and they're rodents. So to protect the squirrels, to try to keep them in my yard, I put up my screech owl box for the squirrels. Now, eventually, as you can see, I got them. Those are the babies born that, that year. They're, they're cute as a button. But right before the squirrels took it in the spring, I actually got a screech owl right for the Christmas bird count. Audubon does this uh, Christmas bird count. And I got a screech owl on the Christmas bird count and then it left. So I did get a picture. I couldn't find it for you today. But if you put up something, just be glad anything uses it. And in time, it's going to rotate out to be different things. But it was funny that once I had squirrels, then I didn't want squirrels. I wanted the, bird, the owl back. But then I had to remember the purpose that I even wanted was squirrels to begin with. So just remember to be patient if you put a box up. It won't necessarily happen right away. Those were the fab four. So we had the great horned owl, then the barred owl then the barn owl, and then the screech owl. And that is in size order, big to little. Bigger birds live longer than littler birds. Condors live a long time. Hummingbirds live two to five years. Same thing. Our other ones uh, that visit us. So you already, look at how much you've learned already. You already know all the permanent resident owls of Illinois. And now the other owls, the other ones, right? They're cool, but they are usually dropping down out of the north, northwest to come in for winter. Uh, to find food. So they're a little bit migratory. If we have a, if they have an easier winter up north, they may not come down. And we are far enough north where I'm at that we may see nesting uh, short-eared, maybe nesting um, long-eared, possibly. Um, we'll see. So the long-eared owl, it's up there, Minnesota, Dakota's um, open nest in trees. These guys look a lot like a, a great horned owl and behave interestingly, they will actually, they're extremely nocturnal. Erin, I don't know if you see that annotation or not. That's going to stress you out, but there's one coming on the, on the screen there. Um, so they're extremely nocturnal. And my part of my belief for at least when they kind of come into Illinois, we have great horned owls and they're very territorial. These guys and the great horns go out at, at dusk, twilight, you know, they're out all night, out in the dawn, and then they go to bed. I'm guessing these long ears, they stay hours into the night, probably to let the great horns kind of have their turn, stay out of their way. This is only my opinion. I would stay out of their way, let them get their belly full, and then go out hunting so there's less chance of conflict. Um, these guys are interesting because they, uh, there was a thing that said they clap, they'll wing clap, and so do the, um, the short-eared owls. And they kind of look kind of built the same. They'll throw their wings together and do some courtship clapping. Uh, sometimes they're found in loose colonies and we call that a parliament, a parliament of owls. That one's always fun. There's your long-eared. Now I always see the one, the, the picture of Ken's is what I see. I just can't help, but I, I know Sarah Tobias is out there coming up with a whole bunch of funnies. My thought is, you know, that's the response to somebody saying, oh, we have to do another colonoscopy or that didn't work. We have to repeat that surgery. It's got this shocking look on its face. The one on the left is being more sneaky, but the, one I, the ones I see always seem to have this surprise look on their face. Um, beautiful, look how skinny, long, skinny bird, but look at the colors, almost identical in coloration to the great horned, beautiful animal. We had one on my road that got hit by a car. Ken, the person who took the picture of this long-eared, actually re um, rescued the one he saw. It didn't look like a bird, went back. It was a bird, been hit in the night. He took it to our rehabilitator and it did not survive, but he at least tried, uh, grabbed it um, and took it to the to the to our wildlife rehabilitator who's been in business forever and she's amazing. The short-eared, this is the long and the short of it, of these two, uh, they winter here. There is a pod, a summer pod, a nesting pod just up into Wisconsin. So it's very, possible that ours would stay here and nest if we have the right habitat in one of our forest preserves possibly with a lot of prairie maybe one of our forest preserves with some evergreens and then lots of grassland 
which is where they go when they visit. Uh, they do nest on the ground, so they don't spend a lot of time in that whole uh, pre-fledging time. They have to fledge quickly. They're very vulnerable, just like snowies, um, and they tend to do a hover drop pattern. Um, when I say, but will quarterly, quarterly is when a bird is always flying low, looking for food. Uh, some birds only do that. But then in this case, if they will also then stop, hover, look, and then drop. And there's some different hunting patterns um, that you can watch for. That'll also give you kind of a heads up on which owl that you're looking at. Short-eared owl. There's that one on the left. Looks like he's about to clap, right? And bring those wings straight down. I love the middle one. Um, Joy O'Keefe, a new friend and professor on campus, um, her husband took this picture and it's, it's the typical short-eared owl picture. There is a gentleman who studies short-eared owls. He gives speech, um, you know, programs. He's amazing. I wish I could tell you his name today and I can't, but there, he's doing a lot of research and is very dedicated to these birds. On the right is our rehabilitator on the left and two assistants, and they are releasing a short-eared owl in our forest preserve where they've been seen. You can see the evergreens behind them and minus the, uh, the other birds that kind of went after it right away, you know, all of your crows, jays, and those kinds of things go after and they tend to mob them. Uh, it was released in an area where at least it was familiar and could at least eat uh, if it can just avoid the, the getting picked on. Here's the sawwit, the Northern sawwit. It's the tiny one. It's our tiniest owl, it's a visitor. It really prefers conifers or a mixed conifer deciduous forest, um, loves cavities. Um, the sawwit that was found, some of you probably remember that the sawwit that was found in the Christmas tree for New York City, um, they named it Rockefeller. It was really a female, it turned out to be a female. And the funny thing to me was they nursed it to health and then took it back to where the tree was. But I'm not sure if anybody realized that it may have been picked up along the way because it's, it's area, it's, it's range goes all the way across there. So it's potentially that bird got picked up an hour out of New York and got hauled all the way back west somewhere and it has no idea where it's at now. Um, but they assumed it was in the tree the whole time. And uh, birds get hit on the road all the time. One of the biggest detriments to our birds of prey, especially great horns and bards, uh, they get hit by cars at night because the car lights, our car lights startle rodents and the rodents run across the road. But with those owls and their, and their binocular straight unmovable eyeballs, they just zone in on that moving animal and go straight out into traffic um, and get hit. So that's another reason that, you know, people sometimes throw, sometimes throw food out the window, not packaging anymore like the 70s, litter was horrible but they'll throw food and think, oh, it'll biodegrade or feed something. Well, you throw an apple core out the window and it's right on the edge of the road. And now a mouse comes that night and is working on it. The car light scares it. And now you could have, uh, could have taken out a, an owl uh, unknowingly, obviously, but we have to think about our, our, our food needs to stay with us until we get to a place we can, we can leave it. Not very many pictures of sawwits out there that I could capture for free. The left one is Mark. So I truly appreciate, I love that face though. It'll all scrunched up and sleepy in an evergreen, um, just beautiful and tiny. Um, they say the call sounds like a, a, a like a wet saw noise, you know, a high pitch saw um, sound. And finally, the snowy owl. So the snowy owl is strictly a winter visitor. If you think about Illinois and all the cornfields we have and bean fields, it looks like the tundra when it's snow covered. It's perfect. They aren't eating lemmings down here. But if there's a lot of competition going on up north, or if it's really, really cold and difficult to find food under the snow cover, these guys are, are migratory to that degree. They'll go until they find food. We are having in DeKalb County snowy owls all the time uh, in the winter. They've pretty much started just coming down here to hang out. They do nest on the ground. They have to fledge quickly. They do like um, places where there's moisture. Uh, big, and then farm fields and such. The females are very barred. So in the winter when there aren't young to be also like a juvenile might be also barred. But if you're looking at a bird in the winter, those aren't babies. So if it's a heavily barred bird, like these next ones, look at this one on the left, that's a female. And potentially these all could be females. The middle one I think is also a female. The males tend to be a lot more bright, but you can imagine sitting on a nest on the ground, you'd wanna be as less white as possible, um, unless it was all the way snowy and that broken barred pattern probably hides them. I love the stretch going on. Remember the chaps we talked about in the toolkit? Look at how furred those legs are. It's feathered, but they look furry, right? Um, that's a high protective 
Uh, plus with the cold, right? It protects them in the cold. Here's some more shots that Ken had. I just love these. So I wanted to just share more. There's a, a male on the far right, a female on the far left and a launching bird on the right. looks like that bird already has something in mind. You can see the wing length on that animal. Just beautiful. There was um, our rehabilitator called me one, one Thanksgiving. She was in Iowa and somebody had a, a snowy owl on the ground in DeKalb, Illinois. And she said, Peggy, I know you've worked with owls. How do you feel about, about picking up an owl and you know getting it into safety? I'm like, I'm fine with that. What do you need? Well, are you sure? Because it's an owl. I said, Kathy, I, if you want me to do this, I can do this. So, um, so it turned out somebody else got gathered it and I had to, I kept it at my house till they got back and was feeding it, um, with, you know, I had gloves and Mitch named it Frosty, you know, that's such a typical name maybe. But the interesting thing was, I guess, because, you know, they don't really see humans much. She clacked her bill a couple times, her wings weren't broken and it was time to feed her supper. And I sat down on the floor and got all this, it was just ground up chicken with bones and all in it. And I got out some forceps and I went to reach in the crate with the forceps to feed her. And she hopped out and I had my leg bent in front of me and with my calf, you know, toward me, like I'm sitting on the floor. She hopped out and land, like hopped onto my leg. Now, remember what we talked about with those talons? And I just sat there and my son goes, that's not really good, is it? I said, do not move quickly. I fed her. She kept clicking better clicking she kept her eye on Mitt and myself turned her head looked at Mitch turned at me ate a bunch hopped off and went back in the crate holy cow all I had on were like flannel pajama pants so but now it's like the best story ever right because I fed a snowy owl that had all those talons on my leg and never did anything um but it oh had she done that it would have hurt but uh as lightweight as you could uh, they're the heaviest bird at four pounds. This bird had been on the ground for a while and was light. It didn't feel like that much weight, but this is the heaviest owl that we have that even over the great horned owl. All right, finding owls. In the questions, there were a lot of people, how do I find them? Well, here's the thing. You have to know what their life range is. Their life range is their habitat, right? Everything they need. So learn about your favorite owl, learn what their habitat is. Be there at twilight and dawn if it's legal. Be careful that you're not supposed to be somebody's property because if they're hungry, they're waiting to leave the nest. If they're a great horn, a bard, they're gonna, especially the great horns, they're taking off right at twilight. They wanna eat this time of year, they got kids to feed. So you'll see that big fat bot. You'll never hear them, right? Remember they fly, cloak of invisibility. You'll never, you'll never hear them, but you'll see them. The other thing you can look for, um, if you have a structure or you know a tree that might have them, look on the ground. Their uric acid, their waste, uric acid is very, um, has a very low um, solubility. So rain doesn't wash it away easily. So if you see a lot of white bird dropping under a, under a perch, a big heavy you know, bird dropping and it's gathering, it might even be a nest uh, space because they have to go to the bathroom and they tip up over the edge of the nest and squirt. And what doesn't catch on the trees gets to the ground. Um, listen for their sounds and their calls and know what the, what you're hearing we had um last year when we knew we had owls across the street there was also another sound it's two and a quarter acres and i had my son go with me i said listen i did i did audio tape it but it's too faint to put on this program i said i keep hearing this and i don't know who it is or what it is and we finally watched quietly it was the call of the female and it was going into evening and he'd been evidently gone out hunting because they were feeding these big babies. It was her call for him to come and to feed them that either it's an all clear or we can't wait any longer. The kids are making me crazy. And I'm hearing it now down the, down the block. So if I sit in my kitchen and look out my window at dusk going into twilight, or if I sit out back, like I did the other night, she makes this sound for about 10 minutes at the most. And he's coming across the field and he's got something in his mouth. And it's this real pretty little, Whoop. Whoop. So if you're out hiking, looking for owls, and you hear that right now, this time of year, it's just the prettiest little, whoop. you wouldn't think it was an owl. And that's her letting him know she needs him to get back with something to eat. He's wasting too much time at the grocery store. Um, another thing, if you find pellets, they look like massive cat fur balls with pokey bones in them uh, under a tree. If they're nesting and there's babies, there's going to be a pile of them. I actually have some from last year's owls uh, saved 
Uh, I haven't taken them apart yet. And then anytime with our bigger owls, you, you know, especially your great horns, you're going to find fur, ears, legs, something that didn't fit down their throat. A lot of, a lot of our owls are hunting and eating things whole, you know, right down the hatch. Uh, when you get these bigger birds and there's squirrels and rabbits up there, uh, skunks, there's going to be parts and pieces that are down on the ground um, that don't, you know, get, or when they finally get kicked out of the nest from the kids picking at them and learning. So let me see here. Hold on just a second. Finding owls. Oops. And there's the other one. I guess I did them twice. I was going to delete that other side. The other thing on here that I had was, um, there was one more piece. That's why I saved this one. No, well, maybe not. Maybe we got them all. So here's a picture. So the left photo was from my son, Mitch, when he went to Argentina, remember barn owls are on every continent except Antarctica. Look at the uric acid on the wall. That's a perch. That's consistently being used. And that's our little barn owl species. This is a, this is a snowy owl getting ready to hack a big old <laughs> uh, pellet. We call them a pellet, right? And they do that a long time, working that thing back up out of their gizzard. And on the right, that's mine. I just took this picture. Like, that's why I was a little bit late coming on. Um, I'm like, wait, I have a, an owl pellet. That's a great horned owl pellet. Only, I know that only because I found it in a quarry and the person said they have a great horned owl and they're so territorial. There's nobody else that's going to be there or hack up something that big. Those two pieces were together. That all had to come back out before it ate again out of the gizzard. So I thought that was kind of cool um, as things go for people like myself. And then I also have this little one. This was out of my backyard years ago. And I cleaned this one. There's a penny in there for scale. If you ever need to send somebody a picture and say, what is this? Um, always throw something in there, a pencil, a penny, anything that gives us reference. And then the jawbone out of there is two inches. So I'm guessing that was in a pellet. So I'm guessing that was probably a great horned owl years ago, still in our neighborhood here. And that, that jawbone, I haven't, um, I haven't, uh, you know, figured out which one it is, but it's definitely um, not an herbivore because it has all its teeth. It's not missing those canines. It had canines, molars, and incisors. So it could have been anything from a young possum to a mink, but it's all in that box, a bunch of it. Um, and it's interesting to me that you can find out what they're eating and what's in there. But it also tells us that they're very susceptible, right? Because they're eating everything. And if there's anything involved with those animals they're eating, that can, it can mess them up. So what's the big deciding factor? Everybody wanted to know something about what makes, how can I get an owl here? What's the big thing? It's habitat, you guys. They have to have sustainability. They have to have um, these things. So the, what, you can, what you can do, you can develop your grasslands. Somebody in the questions, they're developing a prairie, grasslands, more trees, mow less, um, so that the animals, the food chain comes and they have places to eat places to sleep. And yes, but to the person who asked about rodent poison, a lot of people don't realize that putting out rat and mouse poison in a garage or in a shed, those animals are going to get sick and go outside and die. And if they're not dead yet and get picked up by one of our birds, it's going to cause a hemorrhage situation. So it is really important that we, um, if we need to get rid of rodents, we get rid of them in a different way or any animal. Poison is not ever going to help any of us um, in the long run in our food chain. And please consider planting uh, native plants um, in your yard. Build your food chain. You have to build it from the plants to the insects. The insects draw the insectivores like shrews and, the, and other, other things and other, other plants that the rodents want to get to, the mice want to live in, the voles. You're, you have to create a food chain and people don't always want to do that. Native plants don't necessarily draw all that, but if you're aiming for owls, you're going to have to start at the bottom and work your way up. Because, and, and just like coyotes, the great horned owl is attracted to what, guard, to what gardens and trash cans bring. The coyotes aren't eating the trash, they're there for the rodents. The, the great horned owls aren't there for the gardens, they're there for the skunk that wants to come there, right? Or the animal, like the rabbit that wants to eat your plants. Um, they're coming for what is there, not, not for those things, but that's what draws them. All right, so really quickly for those who asked a lot of questions about nest, nest box, this is on that, that nestwatch.org. You don't have to put that whole link in right there, but if you, um, I believe if you uh, hover over it, you might be able to um, control click it. But this is, I just wanted to show you what's on here. They show you the animal, you pick your bird, your owl, shows you the nesting. And then the question somebody had was how high up in the air. So right after that, 
they actually, let me get back over to my other screen here. Um, they actually show you that entrance hole size, height, anywhere from 10 to 30 feet, spacing between the boxes. You don't want competition, how deep, which direction. This is a fantastic website. And then you can pick what you want, okay? So that's, I talk really fast because there's, there's like, so it's so exciting. These are just amazing birds. So they also um, had additional tips on, on the frame below this one. And you could do everything you wanted to for any of the Fab Four but you're not going to build a nest box for the ones that come in. They're not nesting here. They're visiting. So you really only need to focus on the Fab Four if you want to draw them year round. Now, built in, time for a commercial break because I have been talking so fast. What I would, um, as I tell you about this program, I'm going to ask you in lieu of going on to another site to do another survey, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about, I was, I asked uh, if I could talk about my, my WeNAP program, the person who helps me with that, Judy Hodges on this call, my amazing partner in crime for developing uh, a program for little people. So I'm going to ask you um, these next questions, but then while I'm, while I'm asked, while you're thinking about these questions, I'm going to tell you a little bit about that program in case you're interested in it for people in your world, grandchildren, nieces and nephews, children in your neighborhood, um, summer education moments. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the program, but in the meantime, when we evaluate for extension, we're looking to see if we made any kind of difference at all. If we shared information um, at a non-research level, made it digestible, if you will, um, for you to gain information and take it where you will. And I highlighted what I'm looking for, and you don't have to do this, but if you want to answer one, two, or three of these in the chat, the chat gets saved. Did you learn something new about Illinois Owls today that you didn't know when we started? Are you going to do something? You know, we always look for action. Are people going to take what we give them for knowledge and do something with that to help themselves or the environment in this case? And then do you feel like you could share some of this with others? Did it make sense enough that you could go to a neighbor and say, so this is what I know, right? So while I'm sharing about the wee nats, if you think about, did you learn something? Are you going to do something? And would you share something? That would be huge while you're, while you're considering that in the chat. That would be awesome. And then the WeNAT program. So Judy and I put together a We Naturalist program for four to seven year olds, and all of them are completed but one. And May is coming up, and you can see the list of choices and what they look like. And what you can do is register for these. They are $5. I'm, it was my only uh, attempt at cost recovery during the pandemic. And But for $5, you get what we usually do in person um, each month you get a lesson that's based on a story and you take that story and then we do a hike. I have a little wee net trail. It's just me doing the actual videoing and just editing. It's very organic. It's just Miss Peggy and the child watching. The nice thing is the videos are split. So if they're tired after listening to the story, they can wait and do the lesson and listen. And then the thing that I love is I go different places. I've read the book. I read the book by a huge tree with the beavers had chewed on when we talked about animal tracks. I uh, did some Venn diagramming on this dirt is misplaced soil and we looked at different soil. So if you're interested in that, you simply would go to my unit webpage, which is for Boone, DeKalb and Ogle counties. So if you put in um, Illinois extension, Boone, DeKalb, Ogle, or so you'll find us. And our page looks like that. It's a beautiful page. Thanks to Judy keeping us looking beautiful. And right below that on our main page, see my little arrow there, you just go down and that WeNAT box, it, this is a slider, it moves, but if it's not where you want it, you just click these little back and forth buttons. You're looking for the We Naturalist. And then when you hit the We Naturalist button, it'll take you right to the registration page and you can register for one, for none, you know, but if you're interested and you have kids, teacher friends, this is for teachers, could do it for their whole classroom. Um, for $5 a lesson, you can do all seven of them, you know, for what, $35. So if you're interested, I wanted to throw in a commercial break um, while you considered um, some feedback in the uh, chat there today and letting me know if that met your needs, um, if you feel like you could tell people about what you learned, et cetera. And finally, and the most important thing of the day is one of my favorite people in extension, uh, right alongside Judy, is Erin Garrett. She's our host today, and she is doing shade gardens. I absolutely love this picture of her flocks, or somebody's flocks. They're gorgeous. So May 13th, 
um, she will be offering this just like we're doing right now. And she'll be offering shade gardens, native plants, ecological benefits. This is the base for building an, an owl uh, habitat, right? This is just what we talked about. So if, if you want to, you can sign up. You can go to that, that link right there at the go.illinois.edu slash shade natives. Or you could go to Everyday Environments on the State uh, University of Illinois Extension webpage. And I have exhausted you all, not only myself, and Erin and Judy. So Erin, what do we do next? Thank you so much, Peggy. Um, wonderful talk, really great comments in the chat box. So thank you everyone for sharing those. Um, I am putting the registration information for upcoming Everyday Environment webinars in the chat box. And I will just note that the shade garden is almost full already. So um, if you are interested, sign up today because I can't guarantee that it's going to be up too much longer. <laughs> um, all right, we have a few questions that have come in, Peggy. Um, and I'm just going to take a couple of them since we are a couple minutes after two. But um, do you have any um, information to share about interactions between owls and bats? Do you know if there's any research or? Um, some uh, owls eat bats. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> because they're out at night and they just, they're mammals, right? It's a small mammal. It just happens to be a, a, a winged animal. I'm pretty sure the barred owls eat them. I don't think, um, I don't know if the screech owls would, it's possible. Um, I, the barn owls tend to focus mostly on voles and uh, field rodents, but that doesn't mean, but yeah, they're basically, that's, that's a, an interaction that becomes predator and prey. Okay, great. Um, and then someone was asking if um, you've heard of owls um, <clears throat> going after small dogs, say in their backyard, um, oh, or yeah. if yes, in general yes. they'll so, leave them alone. <laughs> that's actually a good question, and I meant to bring that up. the The time of year when people struggle with chickens, pets is fall. Now the parents quit feeding things like large baby great horned owls, um, and they once they fix on something they wait there. They'll sit there and wait. So if you have free range chickens, fall's not the time to let them free range. Um, I had a friend who said, no, it can't be an owl. I said, no, it's an owl because their MO is to like for chickens, they open up the back of the head and neck. Um, I said, that's an owl. That's a, that's an owl for sure. He set a live trap for a mammal and caught a juvenile great horned owl in a mammal live trap with one of the dead chickens. So, and once they see that, they don't know how to, they're, they just assume there's always going to be food there. The other example, my niece is a vet technician, um, a basset hound puppy, brand new puppy, took it out that evening to go potty. A young great horned owl tried to grab it and injured it. This, now what the vet doesn't know is the, the owl now goes back to the perch and says, hey, there was one animal there. Maybe there's another one. I'm going to sit here and wait. They got home from the emergency vet clinic. She took it out to potty. The same bird came down and now split its ear in half. Back to the emergency room. So yes, they are, but mostly it's those young, um, incompetent hunters, but it isn't out of the question. Barn cats, everybody blames coyotes for everything. And there's a lot of things that happen that are great horned owl related. Great horned owls, uh, it's too easy. Uh, cats are too easy. So um, barn cat, barn kittens easily. You cannot remove, there was a question, legally you have to have a permit to remove a a bird from your area that's eating, you know, you need a nuisance permit. And again, you can go to the Illinois Department of Natural Resources, uh, their website and get a, uh, a nuisance permit. Those, all of our birds are protected by the federal government. Um, and it is a hefty fine if something is found out that you've harmed them in any way. So please do it correctly for the sake of the animal and um, yourself. But yeah, pets, small pets can be specifically that time of year. I, you know, I'd be I'd be careful, you know, and if it's at night, put them on a leash, you know, just to be safe. And this time of year when they're trying to feed those little babies, right? So um, good, good question. Great, thank you. You answered two, two at one time. <laughs> um, nice. So I'll just do one more just for sake of time. Um, yes. um, someone asked if owls are attracted to pine trees slash do they nest in conifers? And that there was one, and I can't remember the name that you were talking about um, in particular. They do, they do like conifers. Our great, great horned owls that nested here last year, be, you know, behind me now a block away are in conifers both times, big, big white pines. 
Um, uh, the cover those provide in the winter with the wind, you know, is pretty, pretty solid. Now, if there was a big hole in a tree, they might choose that because it would be completely covered. The hawks used to be down there. So basically they've switched spots. The hawks moved. So the owls took their nest and then they're not great nest builders. They pretty much have to have something in place and the branches of a pine tree kind of make a nice funnel um, to hold them with what little they can create for a nest. Great, well, thank you so much, Peggy, for again, a wonderful presentation and for answering those questions. Thank you to all of our participants who joined us today. As we said, this recording will be uploaded to YouTube and shared with you, um, hopefully in a week or two, um, but don't hold us to that. So thank you for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day and we hope to see you next month. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks, Erin, for always your ex perfect professionalism and help. I couldn't do it without you. <laughs> Not a problem. Right, take, take care, care, everyone. Take care. Bye.